Hi, I'm Gary, and this is episode 185 of EV Musings, a podcast about renewables, electric vehicles, and things that are interesting to electric vehicle owners. On the show today, we'll be looking at a homemade electric vehicle with a bit of a difference. This season of the podcast is sponsored by ZapMap the free-to-download app that helps EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Before we start, I wanted to tell you about next week's episode. We hear a lot about how public charging is so expensive. Why are some CPOs charging 70 pence plus per kilowatt hour when the wholesale price is way less than that? Well, I've had a look into it, and I'll be laying out for you how the price is calculated, what hidden costs there are that you don't get charged on a personal energy bill, and how some companies can get away with being much cheaper than others. That's next week on the podcast. Our main topic of discussion today is around a homemade electric vehicle that did something not many others have done. Went all the way across the United States. More on the detail about that later. First, though, I want to ask you to cast your mind back to episode 156, the EV conversion episode. In that show, we spoke to Richard Moggy Morgan from Electric Classic Cars. He converts fossil fuel cars to electric for a living and is the owner of, amongst other things, the fastest VW combo conversion in the world. We also spoke with Tom Cheeseman, who took an old BMW Z4, some parts from a Prius, a bit of ingenuity, and created an electric version of his own. Impressive as both these have been, I think that what we're all missing was a merger between the two. Someone with no experience of converting cars to electric who can take a VW combi van, convert it to electric, and then try something which might seem impossible, driving it across the continental United States in winter into one of the biggest ice storms on record. I'd like to welcome to the show someone who's done just uh, that, YouTuber Louis Cole. Welcome, Louis. Hey, thanks for having me. You're here today to talk about a journey you took with a homemade electric camper van across the United States, but that's just a small section of your YouTube channel. Explain to the listeners what your channel's about and some of the other things that you've done. Um, So I started YouTube probably 12 years ago now, and it's been quite a wild ride. I think a lot of what I was, a lot of the content I've been making over the years was just documenting my life, a lot of my travels, adventures around the world. For a long time, I was vlogging every single day, which was uh, quite a challenge. But for that season of my life, I really loved it. Kind of grew a big following on YouTube and across different socials. And uh, I was just excited by the opportunity to, I don't know, I guess encourage people to, to get out there, to push out their comfort zones, to explore the world to be kind to one another. Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the things I try to do had some kind of bigger social impact perspective often. And sometimes it was just kind of fun adventures, whatever it was, skydiving, doing crazy things. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's been my journey. And then I think, you know, I've done some, I've done some big kind of challenges over the years. I, my, my friend's a pilot and we circumnavigated the world in a small single engine Cessna. And now I would love to do something electric with planes, but I don't know where we are technology-wise with that. I also, did just more like man-powered feats, like I cycled from London to Africa uh, with a whole group of friends raising money for a uh, charity. And then we kayaked the length of the Thames. And then um, when, when lockdown happened, kind of uh, the whole COVID thing, I was uh, living in LA with my wife and a bunch of friends. We had like a community house. And I decided, wouldn't it be amazing to take my 1973 camper van, which I'd, I had had for five years, but had had a complete nightmare with the, with the engine. I think it kept breaking and caught fire once and very unreliable. And I had heard whispers of people that had taken the engine out and, and put in an electric motor. So I did my research, found a guy in, in the US called Jehu who only, Jehu Garcia, he only lived like an hour away from me. So I, he- I headed over to meet him, look at some of his conversions. And then that started me on the journey of, of doing my own conversion. I went down to a company called EV West in San Diego and 
met an awesome guy called Michael and they kind of talked to me through a lot of what they'd been doing with classic cars and bringing them back to life. And I just thought, wow, this is amazing. Like all these incredible vehicles. So you had so much character that had been giving a new lease of life. And not only that, had actually been improved uh, much faster, way more reliable. And so, yeah. So end of 2020, I started converting my van. And by the, well, was it end of 2020? Yeah, no, no, begin, beginning of 2020. Through, throughout 2020, let's just say that. And then, yeah, by the end of 2020, it was actually done. Uh, to, it was completed probably to 90%. And people that watch any of my vlogs or, or the series where I tried to drive it across the US will realize it wasn't quite finished to the point I needed it to be. There was a few little issues which we can go into. But anyway, so yeah, then uh, I had it in LA, drove it over a thousand miles, maybe a couple of thousand miles around LA throughout the year, year or two I was there. And then um, end of last year, drove it from... LA almost to New York. Now, I do want to come on back and talk about that in a little bit more detail later on, but let me just loop back to the actual sort of genesis of this. You've got the old VW camper van, you ripped out the engine, you've added batteries and a motor, and then you decided to take the more or less untested machine right across the US. So the first question is, how, how many electric conversions have you done before? This was my first electric conversion. Did that seem like an issue? I I like living life with an element of risk, maybe more so than others. So I I was willing to experience kind of the 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 challenges and problem solving of uh, trying to figure that out. So yeah, I wasn't too worried if if I ran into issues. And honestly, like the the it was so unreliable before, and I'd done quite a few long road trips across multiple states before it was electric and I'd had so many issues with it. I was like, you know, yes, they're going to be different issues, but I don't think they're going to be any more severe than like the, the engine catching fire and breaking down the side of the highway. I mean, it was just, it was just a whole set of other issues I was running into. It, it certainly was. And I've watched all the, uh, the videos. We'll, we'll link them all out in the, uh, in the show notes. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second, but had, have you ever driven an electric vehicle prior to that? Not really. No, I, I'd driven Jay who's electric. He had an old split screen Volkswagen van and I'd driven that a little bit around. And then I, I, I had a go on some of the conversions that they'd done down in EV wet, uh, EV West, but I hadn't actually driven a modern electric car, which was quite funny because obviously when people talk about the future of cars and transportation, and that we should go electric. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about modern electric cars, which have all the safety features, you know, auto driving and all the luxury of Teslas and, you know, all of the brands that are releasing electric cars now. Uh, <laughs> it's not so much throwing electric motors in, in old, unreliable, uh, often unsafe cars, but I kind of... I, I don't know. I, I guess my, yeah, I guess you're, you're asking whether I drove electric cars. No, I guess I knew I would at some point, but I just hadn't actually got around to, I think, do you know what I think it is? Is because I was traveling nonstop and we were like nomadic, unless I was specifically looking to rent an electric car, which often is quite hard, hard to do with car rental companies. There wasn't a, a situation where I was able to drive a new electric car at the time. Now, obviously, you've talked about the, the conversion itself, and um, I know we'll come on a little bit later to your VW Beetle. You're working with uh, uh, Moggy on that, who we've had on the podcast before. But talk to me about how long it took you to do the actual conversion on the, um, on the camper van. Yeah, let me think. So there was a few things we had to wait on, but once I'd really got started, I want to say it was about three months of work. And obviously not full time. I think in total, I'm trying to think how many days it was if I'd worked nonstop on it. I was probably working, I was probably doing three or four days a week, or maybe three, let's say three days a week. Uh, so 12, yeah, I reckon it was a month, pretty much a month of solid work. But I think a lot of that was me 
custom building these aluminium battery boxes from scratch with zero like skills to do that. I was having to figure it all out. And we also, one of the things looking back that I would definitely change, Jay, who had thought it'd be a really cool idea to store all of the batteries underneath the vehicle, like, you know, like modern electric cars do. It's the whole base of the vehicle. The chassis is like where the big battery bank is. And so I feel like that was so ambitious. And as we find, as we'll find out, uh, talking about the, the, trip across America, I think that was ultimately my downfall was storing all of the, all of the batteries actually underneath. And because of that, and I had a lot of comments about this, I actually had to drill into the chassis and people were questioning the integrity of the, the chassis of the, the van, because I'd kind of bolted all of these battery boxes underneath. So that was actually the, the most time consuming thing, which I think had I got some pre-made battery boxes or even built battery boxes that didn't need to be so weather tight and actually had them inside the van, I think it would have been quite a lot quicker. I know you recently saw another VW camper van conversion at Fully Charged Live down in Farnborough and their conversion was quite different to, to yours. Is that the kind of thing that you were talking about? Did they, where did they put the batteries on that one, do you recall? Yeah, so I've seen a few and Mog Moggy's got one as well. He's got like a 1970 something bay window that he's actually put a much more powerful Tesla motor in. Uh, and and do you know what I was jealous about uh, what I was jealous about his one is he can fast charge his because of the the higher voltage he's running on. But anyway, uh, Moggy and this other company I I saw it fully charged called uh, Electric Car Converts. I think that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, based over in Lewis is a guy, Barnaby. He had, both of them had put their batteries under the seats and in the 1970s version of the van, the T2, they had, uh, where the fuel tank was, there's quite a lot of space in there to put a few batteries. I had, I was quite ambitious in mine cause I put 14 Tesla modules, which is like 70 kilowatt hours. It's basically almost what, you know, a full Tesla battery pack. Whereas I've seen a few of the other conversions where they've, you know, maybe only put seven in or something. So it's shorter range, but often you don't need, what I, what I tried to do last year was quite unusual because of the range limitations. Most people with doing these self-conversion projects aren't trying to do massively long road trips. They just want to have a fun, nostalgic vehicle to drive around town. And I think that's what they're brilliant for. But I kind of wanted to push the limits and uh, wanted to pack as many batteries in as possible. But yeah, if I was to do it again, I would definitely put all the battery storage inside the vehicle, which is what I'm going to do with my Beetle. Ah, yes. We'll come on to the Beetle in a second because uh, that sounds fascinating as well. Now, if I was doing a trip like this, I would have started with a much shorter journey, say, up the Pacific Coast Highway, LA to San Francisco, long enough to mm -hmm. find out what the problems are, but not too long that a serious issue would have been a disaster. But you just went right ahead and sort of took the bull by the horns and decided you were going to do right the way across the, the US. Was there an aspect of, well, it'll look really good on the channel if there's a problem, or is it genuinely... I'm not bothered what's happening. I'm going to do it anyway. There was a few things. I, my wife was pregnant and we've now had our, our first baby. And I realized there's this fairly short window that I've got to do a crazy kind of month long adventure solo before I need to be a little more uh, settled down, at least for the moment with, with the baby being here and stuff. So I wanted to do something that made sense. And also we, I know I, I knew I needed to get to New York because that's where we were going to spend Christmas. Uh, my wife's family are there and we, we were in LA packing up some final bits and collecting the van. And my original plan was to drive to New York or, or honestly, I was looking at anywhere on the East coast 
And then I was looking at options of shipping the van out to the UK, which is where we're going to spend our year with the baby and um, just for this little season. And it wasn't, and I, and that was still the plan until I spoke to Moggy in January or February. And he said, because of the, the alterations I've made to the chassis, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get it legal. I wouldn't be able to bring it legally into the UK to drive because uh, it's, there's much more strict rules on what you can do to cars. Mm. And in the U S it's pretty much anything goes. And, uh, so that kind of, uh, shut down my original plan of bringing it out here and having it as a, as a vehicle out here. So I haven't really made a contingency plan yet, but that is the original thinking behind doing the coast to coast trip. And I thought it was a really cool challenge for the channel to have a coast to coast trip feels a bit cooler than saying, you know, I'm just going to drive the length of California or something. Mm, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now you mentioned about the charging on your camper. You've got AC only, I believe, and you knew you'd have a long time to wait at charges. So what was your estimation of how long you were going to be charging for every day? I thought it would be, we would be looking at an overnight charge each day. And if possible, an, a second charge or at least partial charge. And, and honestly, I think part of my approach to life is trial and error. Let's just figure it out on the go. I'm not too worried about things going wrong or failing because I think that's a beautiful way to learn things in life. And I think sometimes people are too scared. I mean, I'm going a bit more philosophical here, like bigger picture, but I think it applies to a lot of things I do. I'd rather, as long as it's not dramatically bad, outcomes that are kind of be really, really bad, you know, but I think I'd rather test things fail and then come up with a plan. And that's kind of what I did. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, one of the things that sort of came out of that was your, the, the solution that you found of being able to use the RV hookup. So park up in an RV um, park and then use their, however many amps it is on that. I don't think that was originally in your plan, was it? So. I, how did that sort of come about? Yes. So I'm trying to remember his name. There was a guy, there's a few guys I've met along the way that have been in this space that are kind of excited about doing these kind of projects. And there's a guy I got told about who had taken one of EV West's converted camper vans, a similar age camper van to mine, and done a cross country trip back last year or the year before. I want to get his name right because he really helped me because he, he gave me lots of advice on what he did. And he was the one that actually gave me the idea of doing the RV parks. I think his name was, I just feel bad, uh, not, not actually giving him credit. Yeah. So he, he'd done it and he'd, I think done a lot more planning than I had. And, uh, probably quite surprised that I was trying to wing it as much as I was. Oh, here we go. Jack Smith. So he, he had a Facebook page. I don't think he was making YouTube videos, but he had a Facebook page where he did a drive from San Francisco to New York on the Lincoln Highway. And uh, he's got a Facebook page called An Electric Tribute to America's First Road Trip. Yeah, he, was, he, he had the same charging speed as me. He was, I think he did it at a much better time of year. So it's a lot warmer. I think he did it in the summer or something, which I should have done really if I had the option, but I didn't. So he gave me a lot of advice. And yeah, the main bit of advice was stop at RV parks because they've got the 50 amp hookup and then you can charge at the seven and a half kilowatts an hour versus the two and a half kilowatts an hour I could off normal 110 volts because in the US, the mains power is only 110 volts. So it's, it's, it's slow charging for sure. If you're just trying to charge off a, a normal plug. Let's talk about your route. Now you, you all, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Smith there who took a, uh, a slightly different northerly route. Uh, you stayed as far south as you could for quite a long time. And then you had that option of, well, I can go north and then east or east and then north. What, what was your thinking behind the routing that you actually took? Or was that again, well, I'll just head off and see where it takes me. Well, my theory was the further south I stayed, the warmer it was going to be. And I knew, and I correctly, correctly, you know, as, as I did find out that 
if I was going to start driving into really cold conditions, I was going to run into at least massively diminished battery range. Uh, I didn't know I was going to be stuck in like one of the craziest uh, kind of Arctic storms. That I don't know what they called it, but it was like all over the news. I don't know if you remember, but those northern states at the end of last year got smashed with like super, super cold weather. So I I didn't know that was heading my way, but I did know that it was going to get very cold and it was just going to be less enjoyable and lessen my range. The The other thing I didn't mention was I, in the US, I only had a type one AC charger. And although there is a pretty good infrastructure for electric car charging across the States, it's not the type one chargers. They are really hard to find. And most of them are the, um, I think like the type two, some of the CSS, and then obviously the Tesla network, but it's all of the faster charging is where they've built the really robust infrastructure. But because the type one's the slow charging, uh, it was really hard to find, even with all of the apps to find the charging ports. And that's also why I did the RV parks, because honestly, some of the stretches that I, I was driving, there was no charging options. And again, I don't, and I, I think some people were like, oh, I'm never getting an electric car because of this series, which is a bit sad. And that was kind of not what I was hoping to communicate because people need to understand. And I'm sure most intelligent people understand that's, that is not your typical electric car experience. And if they were to get a modern electric car, you know, most of the issues I was running into aren't going to be an issue. Oh, I, absolutely. Uh, I think it's worth saying um, yeah. exactly what you said there. Yeah. It, the, the, <laughs> the question that does jump out to me, uh, well, there are, there are two that relate to your approach to actually driving the, the, the camper. The first one is, why did you not include a heater of some sort in the build? Well, I was talking about it. And when we were building, there were a few things still on the list. Like I said, it was only 90% completed, really. There was a few important things that I hadn't quite fixed. But because it was running and charging, I was like, well, you know, this is good enough. I, would, I wish I had. I, 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 what's interesting is the, before I converted to electric, it also didn't have heating in the front because I don't know whether they typically do, but for whatever reason, mine didn't. I know they're air cooled and the, and the motor's at the back of the vehicle. So I think modern or even, I think heating systems typically are running through the, the radiator or they're taking heat from the radiator, but I didn't have a radiator because it was all air cooled. I think, so I'd already experienced it without heating. What I hadn't experienced is, is winter. And when I was converting it, it was the blistering heat of the summer in California. So the last thing I was thinking about was heating because <laughs> uh, I wasn't really planning ahead. And, and back when I converted, I didn't, I didn't think I would be taking it necessarily into like snowy, cold conditions. Mm. So yeah, it was, it, I probably could have planned ahead more and, and had options available. And I definitely want to put heating in my Beetle or any of my future conversions. I have to put a heater in them. The second question then is, um, your first couple of days when you left LA, they weren't particularly happy ones. You ran out of charge on a couple of occasions or very, very close to that. Mm -hmm. And it was the hills that caused most of it. Did you know that hills would sap the range as much as they did? I really didn't know how much I, I had a few comments of that, like people saying that I was, uh, they didn't believe me that I was, I don't know that I had underestimated so much. I also, yeah. Cause I think when you're driving a regular combustion, combustion engine, you don't even think about hills really, unless they're like super steep, but I've never, I've never related fuel consumption to driving up a mountain and I also, when you're doing normal navigation, you don't necessarily know the elevation you're going. I don't think, unless, unless I can't find the option, but I don't think on Google Maps and stuff that there's an ob obvious way to see the elevation gain 
on a route. And I know there's other apps and I started using other apps by the end of the trip, but I remember the first place I tried to get to, I had just looked at the mileage to get there and hadn't realized that final 10 mile stretch was up a really, really steep mountain. So that's kind of what screwed, that was what screwed me on the first day. And I think after those first few days of experiencing those kind of really steep sections and realizing how quickly it zaps the power, I had to adjust my plans. Um, and I think the problem as well, which is a double-edged sword, like sometimes it's great for me, but in this scenario it wasn't, is that I'm like a, an eternal optimist that I'm always like, oh yeah, I should have enough battery. Like I'm always pushing it to the last little bit. and then. Unfortunately, it always, it always seemed to be the end of my day, the last 10, 20 mile stretch that was like the most steep section, which is always when I was at my lowest battery uh, capacity. I know, <laughs> I know there were several times when you charged up enough to get to your next check, the charge point, but well, you thought you had, but in reality, you should have stayed longer. Now you've talked about being a bit of an optimist, but mm. how much of that was in reality, I miscalculated. Or in reality, what I actually did as <laughs> I was actually quite bored of sitting there waiting because, you know, you, you weren't doing a, you know, a 45 minute or 50 minute or a one hour charging stop. You were there for five, six, seven hours. So mm. how much of that was, I'm just impatient and I want to get out of here? Uh, no, I mean, I was, I was trying to calculate it. But yeah, maybe partly I was optimistic. There was a few scenarios where like I knew... I needed to charge longer. There was one charger where they, they closed it because some of them were like connected to other random, you know, some of them were like by car showrooms or around the back of like a fast food restaurant. And there was one in particular that I, that I knew I needed probably another hour's charge and they closed early for some reason. Cause it's ne also, it's never the same as what it says on Google with the, with the timing. I knew when they closed that I should have probably went to look for another charger in that town before I left. But that's when I was just like, oh no, maybe I'll be okay. And then that was also one of the days I, I had a really bad breakdown. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of several, I mean, you, uh, you ended up having to replace a 12 volt battery at one point because that was, uh, mm -hmm. that was an issue, wasn't it? Um, but I think what I want to focus on now is, as you've mentioned a couple of times, the cold ended up being your nemesis and it, it ultimately yeah. crippled the van. Uh, tell me about that last day on the road and what, what, uh, what went wrong. How far were you away from your destination and what was the actual issue? So I think I got to about 600 miles from my destination, which would have been another four days driving probably. And I, and I had time, I would have made it, but I, there was two things. One, it was a stretch of I can't remember where I was, Pennsylvania or something, where there was, there was barely any RV park. So I was having to really push it to get to like potential places to charge. And it made sense because like who's staying in RV parks in the dead of winter in the Northern States? It's just, I understand how a lot of these RV parks are kind of only really open for the summer. So I had at that point, I, again, I hadn't really accounted that the cold would reduce the range as much. And I'd, I was kind of going off the range I'd had up until that point. So that was one of my issues is like not being able to accurately calculate the range. Oh, and I think we've kind of skipped the point that what, you know, you know, I was saying it's 90% complete. Part of that 10% completion that I hadn't managed to get around to was giving myself an accurate percentage reading of the battery. All I had to go on was the battery's voltage at the front. There was something messed up with my readout, which meant the percentage was never accurate. So I don't know whether it needed to be calibrated. I tried a few times to, to kind of fix it, but basically the display I had in the front only gave me the battery's voltage, which gives you some kind of idea of the percentage if you, if you can kind of do the math in your head whilst you're driving. But the way lithium batteries work is when they get low, it's, there's a sudden drop off of, of capacity. It doesn't, it's not like a, you know, if you looked at the curve of a, of a, of a light, uh, the life of a lithium, not a life, but the usage of a lithium battery, it's not a, a gradual straight line. It, it kind of curves at both ends, if you, if you understand. So 
it was it was always a bit of a a, ge- a guessing. It's always a bit of guesswork to figure out how much battery I had. So that was one issue, and then I just wanted to push on to try and get to New York. And I knew that this storm was closing in and I had this window before it got super, super cold. And I know like Buffalo, New York, which wasn't far from where I was, at, was literally caught in an ice storm. And I don't know if you saw photos, but the houses looked like they were like trapped in ice. It looked like they were hit by like an ice blaster. The whole, ha- all of the whole, t- the whole city was just frozen. So there was like this really scary kind of situation happening where I needed to just go get as far as possible, as quick as possible. And then the night I broke down, so this was the last day, the roads, the the snow really started falling. There were trucks out uh, laying salt on the roads and grit. And so it was like this salty slush on the roads. And what I've since found out, and I didn't understand what had happened, but basically at three in the morning or something, suddenly my display voltage on the readout went haywire and I just lost power. And I was confused because I had seen I had at like 20% battery left, which should have got me to my, where I was heading. And I've since found out that with all the salt and slush, spraying up underneath and there was a lot of snow that actually lodged up in between all the battery boxes so typically even in rain rainy weather it might get a bit of water spray but this was like snow was piling on top of the battery boxes so it only took the slightest gap in my seal on the battery boxes to fail and there was so many you know I'd screwed it all together so there was like hundreds of holes that I had put silicon on but and all of the edges, so it wasn't welded. It was all silicon together and, and screwed. So somewhere the seal had failed and salt water had dripped through into the, one of the battery boxes, which is, could have been deadly. And it had shorted two of the modules. And that had kind of screwed, that had, well, luckily that had told the BMS or something, or maybe it just, I don't exactly know how it worked, but basically it suddenly knew, oh, I'm not getting the voltage I need. Cut off. Luckily, it didn't short the batteries to the point where they had started catching fire and had a thermal runaway or whatever, which is, you know, learning a bit more about it now could have been really scary. So, yeah, so I just broke down, battery shorted. I I didn't really understand what had happened. I thought they'd just got too cold. So I thought I might be able to get it towed somewhere, recharge the batteries and head on my way. But unfortunately, that was kind of the nail in the coffin for that trip. And the solution has been actually to like open up the boxes and replace two of the modules. You're currently in the UK and you've started another VW conversion, this time a classic Beetle. So what did you learn from your camper van conversion and the cross-country trip that you'll use now? in the Beetle conversion? Obviously, like you mentioned, the heater would be lovely. I mentioned briefly that I I definitely, I don't think there'd be an option to mount the batteries anywhere else, but I'm going to put all the batteries inside the vehicle. So there's no risk of cold, uh, like snow or rain damaging the batteries, which is going to be great in the UK because although it's lovely weather right now, uh, if I want to drive it around in the winter, it needs to be completely weatherproof. I think having that last 10% that I didn't really finish, I really want to finish this project so it's a solid conversion that, that, that has all the final touches done. Because I think that's where I kind of cut corners. It's like, oh, it's kind of works. So I don't really need to figure out the final touches. I'd love a really accurate readout display so I'm not left guessing for my battery range. What else? I mean, I think also I, I, because it's my first conversion and I think attention to detail and neatness isn't my strong point. It was a bit of a shambles, like the whole, if you opened up, there was kind of wires hanging everywhere. And, uh, although I kind of vaguely knew what was going on, it, it, you know, it was a bit of a mess. So I'd love to do this one just a, you know, a bit more, do those finishing touches where it's kind of neatly 
done with the wires like nicely kind of tucked away and uh and mounted everything mounted really nicely and i think that's something that moggy's really encouraged me to do and shown me a lot of his builds and shown me the level of quality i could aim for i don't think i'm going to get near to what the electric classic cars guys do with their builds but i think it's it's left me with some inspiration to aim a bit higher and i think this that's admirable i mean you, you're never going to match what people like moggy do because <laughs> they've been doing it for years and they do it for yeah. a living so uh, yeah you know and anyway I thoroughly enjoyed watching all the uh, the videos. Half the time you had me sort of peering through, you know, I'm, I'm behind the sofa looking over going, oh no, yeah. he's going to run out again. He's going to break down. It was uh, fascinating to watch. I will put a link to uh, all those in the notes so everybody else can have a look at that. And uh, Louis, thanks so much for your time. It was a great chatting with you. Yeah, no, really great chatting to you too. I hope... Uh, this hasn't scared people away from looking into converting their cars to electric. Because I think if it's done correctly, it can be a wonderful experience. And I think a lot of people looked at my trip and thought, well, that'd be a nightmare. I'd never want to do that. But I hope people with a bit of adventure and realizing this, this really is, is perfect for kind of more of a town car that you kind of just want to drive around locally. Uh, but I would highly recommend if you've got time, and a passion for preserving kind of the nostalgic cars with a lot of character. Uh, this is a beautiful way, in my opinion, to, to modernize and improve them without kind of, uh, yeah, without having to let go of the past. I think there's something really beautiful about classic car design. And, and uh, yeah, I think we can, it, you know, it's all an experiment. I think we're still in that, that kind of part, part of history where, you know, electric, that, this big transition away from fossil fuels is, is exciting and experimental. And uh, I think that's the whole point for me is it's all a bit of a, an experiment. So hopefully it's encouraged people to, if they've got the, if they've got the re resources to, to give it a go themselves. Excellent. Thank you very much. That certainly sounds like an interesting time Louis had on his Trans America trip. An incomplete van build, no heater, hills, reduced range, technical issues with 12 volt battery, insufficient testing, and some of the worst weather imaginable. You'll recall the polar vortex where temperatures plunged to 15 and 20 degrees below zero across huge swathes of the country. Imagine being in that without a heater. I fully recommend watching the playlist in the show notes. It details Louis's journey across the US in the camper van. What decisions did he make that you would have made differently? I bet there are several, right? It's time for a cool EV or renewable thing to share with your listeners. We've often said on this podcast that the best way to get people into an EV is to physically get people into an EV. In that vein, Oxfordshire has a new mini electric car club, with three rental companies cooperating with regional councils to offer pay-per-use EVs. Six district councils have partnered with car club providers CoWheels, Enterprise Car Club and Tame EV Car Hire to provide rental cars at 14 locations across the county. To use new vehicles, car club membership is required. Members can then hire car club vehicles in the scheme from as little as £5.95 an hour, including insurance, plus 12 pence a mile. Pilot project will be initially run for 12 months to assess the demand for this type of service across Oxfordshire. A nice little initiative. The EV Musings podcast is sponsored by Zapmap, the go-to app for EV drivers in the UK, which helps that EV drivers search, plan, and pay for their charging. Zapmap is free to download and use with subscription plans for enhanced features such as using Zapmap in car, on CarPlay or Android Auto. And that's the show for today. Hope you enjoyed listening to it. If you want to contact me, I can be emailed at evmusings at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter at MusingsEV. If you want to support the podcast and newsletter, please consider contributing to becoming an EV Musings patron. The link is in the show notes. Don't want to sign up for something on a monthly basis? If you enjoy this episode, why not buy me a coffee? Go to coffee.com slash evmusings and you can do just that. ko-fi.com slash evmusings. Takes Apple Pay too. I have a couple of ebooks out there if you want something to read on your Kindle. So, 
You've gone electric. It's available on Amazon worldwide for the measly sum of 99p or equivalent, and it's a great little introduction to living with an electric car. So, you've gone renewable. It is also available on Amazon for the same 99p, and it covers installing solar panels, a storage battery, and a heat pump. Why not check them out? Links for everything we've talked about in the podcast today are in the description. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe. It's available on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave a review as it helps raise visibility and extend our reach in search engines. If you've reached this part of the podcast and are still listening, thank you. Why not let me know you've got to this point by tweeting me at MusingZV with the words, is it me or is it cold in here? Hashtag, if you know, you know, nothing else. Thanks as always to my co-founder, Simon. You know, I asked him why he tends to take out the drone on his electric unicycle rides when he knows he has issues with it. On one day, it'll end up either landing on someone's roof, getting hit by a bus, or dropping into a river. All his camera investment down the drain. He told me, I I like living life with an element of risk. Thanks for listening. Bye.